is I was I was watching some YouTube videos and I was thinking about the 1990s when I was growing up in Ohio. And one thing that I became aware of, and I remember it very vividly, very, very vividly. It was a very, very big part. And thank you, Briar, too, for that very, very lovely uh, super chat. One thing I remember very, very vividly is what people have now come to describe as the satanic panic. The satanic panic. And this was the 1970s, especially in the 1980s and up into the 1990s when I was a kid. Phenomenon of religious groups picking out things in mainstream U.S. society and declaring them to be satanic. And it was a big thing. When I was a kid, everything, everything was satanic. The Teletubbies, I was informed by many of my classmates and kids who lived down the street and that, that the Teletubbies were secret homosexual propaganda, right? Because there's Tinky Winky had a triangle on his head. And if you watched, if you watched the Teletubbies, your kids were going to turn gay. So no one kid was allowed to watch the Teletubbies. No kid ever. Uh, the Power Rangers, where did their power come from? Clearly it came from a source other than God. So they were Satanists. Harry Potter, witchcraft, Satanism. And it was this thing, you know, and you can go Further back, right? I mean, the earliest example of this kind of silliness uh, was, I remember, uh, I don't remember, I wasn't alive, but the Beatles, right? The Beatles gave an interview, and John Lennon said in the interview, we're more popular than Jesus. Just, just making the point that Jesus is so popular, he's using it as an expression, right? Like, we're richer than Bill Gates. We're more popular than Jesus. And I'm not defending the Beatles, but that's a whole other conversation. And so, Christian groups were furious, and they began burning Beatles albums. And there was this evangelical Christian, you know, it was before they began evangelical stuff, but, you know, tent revival Baptist kind of people were burning, burning Beatles records. Oh my God, he said he's more powerful. You know, it was, it was an infuriating thing. It was big. And, you know, then you get up into the 70s, you have backmasking, and someone's already mentioned it in the comments, where people would play records backwards, the old vinyl records, and they'd play them backwards, and they would play it backwards, and it would go, and people say, see, it says Satan is the leader, and people would hear a voice, you know, you play a record backwards, and it would go, right, and I think it's like one of the Beatles albums, you play it backwards, it says, turn me on, dead man, turn me on, dead man, Right? Or, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, and you play, you know, Stairway to Heaven backwards. It sounds like there's no escape. There's no escape. And it was this crazy thing where, like, middle American Christian folks were seeing Satan everywhere. Everywhere. And and it's it's crazy. I mean, it was like they were, like, they were infuriated. I mean, it was like Satan was everywhere, right? And and people started joking around, like Weird Al Yankovic eventually like would like backmask things on purpose as like a comedy, as like a joke. And it was a big thing. And when I was a kid, I remember, you know, I mean, the kids down the street from me were not allowed to watch, you know, anything related to Star Trek and Star Wars because it was clearly satanic. And the, the, there was, you listen to some of this stuff that these people were saying. These, these, you know, satanic panic Christians were saying. And it was quite unbelievable. Um, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't just that, you know, that the world is not Christian and we need to be Christian. It's like the government is completely infiltrated by, by Satanists, right? That, 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 you know, you know, I, I mean, it, it, they, this was like some really, really, in a way, anti-establishment right-wing stuff, right? I mean, it was like they had a conspiracy theory, that was was vast, right? And and I know like uh, the reporter who's now a big Fox guy, Geraldo Rivera. He did a segment. Uh, he did a big piece about like, sure, belief in Satan is a matter of religious belief, but there are millions of Satanists in the United States, and it was like people thought there were like secret cults of devil worshippers. There was a book called Michelle Remembers. Michelle Remembers. It was a bestseller, and it was this woman. Uh, it was it was like a child. She had gone to see a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist had hypnotized her, and she remembered that she had been kidnapped and and molested and raped and tortured by some satanic group, 
and that she, you know, had been held in a cage for months and months and months. Well, she had, you know, it's been proven that she had perfect attendance at her school, so that wasn't the case. However, when she grew up, when she became an adult, she married her psychiatrist, the one who hallucinated, you know, hypnotized her and had to remember all of this. And everyone was just panicking. And there was like this fear that like Satanists were going to come abduct little children and torture them. And, and it was this weird, weird thing. It was like, it was the satanic panic. And it wasn't a New York City thing. It was not a Southern California thing. It was very much like a, an Ohio, Iowa, Missouri thing. It was, it was very, very bizarre. And everyone was convinced that there was this secret satanic plot hiding under every pillow and every rock and they were coming to get you and, and, you know, you couldn't listen to rock music and you couldn't watch mainstream television shows because Satan was everywhere. What was going on? What in the world was this? When I was a kid, I, I mean, my family wasn't into it. We were not evangelicals. We were mainstream, mainline Protestants. And But like everyone at my school, my school, they weren't allowed to have the Harry Potter books. They weren't allowed to have Harry Potter books at my school because, you know, uh, oh my God, you know, can't have Harry Potter in the school library. And, and you know, I mean, the, uh, the town library, people were constantly demanding that books be removed because they were satanic. And it's like the little children are going to see things on TV that are going to make them satanic. What was going on? And you'll notice there are a lot of, like, historical lectures about this stuff on the internet, but they don't have any analysis. They don't, right? You can watch, I think, Seth Andrews, who's one of the big atheists. He has a big, long presentation, which I listened to the other day, and he doesn't analyze this at all. It's just kind of, he doesn't like it. He talks about how when he was young, they would go out and burn heavy metal records, and, and they thought at their Christian rallies that they could hear screams of the demons being burned as they burned the these records, and of course they couldn't. That was the sound of like vinyl records burning. But they were convinced they could hear the actual screams. And it's it's people people talk about the satanic panic of the 70s, especially the 80s and 90s. They talk about it, but they there's no real analysis of what was going on. What in the world was going on? What was going on? Why was this happening? What was going on? And no, I did not grow up near the west side of Cleveland. And um, what was going on? Well, here's the thing. Here's what was going on. I, Caleb Moppin, will tell you what was going on. And bear with me. It's a little bit of a longer explanation. I will tell you what was going on. Why people were listening to records backwards and hearing things, and why best-selling books were claiming that secret satanic cults were going to kidnap you, and I will tell you what was going on. Here's what was going on. So, the ruling class of the United States and of Western Europe was very divided during the Cold War about how to defeat communism. And there were two schools of thought about how to defeat communism. The first school of thought, which was popular among factory owners, National Association of Manufacturers, J.P. Morgan, their school of thought was to defeat communism, we must build the most authoritarian society possible. We are going to reinforce patriotism. We are going to reinforce religion. We are going to militarize the economy and, you know, sell lots of guns and guns to, you know, military industrial complex. Uh, and we are going to have a militarized, patriotic state, and we are going to outlaw communists, and we're going to put them all in jail, and we're going to have the Pope declare a holy crusade against the communists, and we are going to march in and destroy communism. Fascism. That's, that's the fascist viewpoint, ultimately. That's what Hitler believed. That's what uh, Henry Ford believed, is that the way to defeat Marxism was to make U.S. society into an authoritarian police state, crush the unions, reinforce, put patriotism everywhere, put religion everywhere, and march in and, and crush communists. And look how well that worked out for Hitler. Uh, sarcasm, of course, right? Look how well that worked out for Mussolini, right? Hung upside down. It wasn't a very good strategy was not a very, very good strategy at all. But it was what the factory owner faction wanted. It's what the, what the industrial capitalists wanted, mainly because labor unions were cutting directly into their profits. 
J.P. Morgan, the National Association of Manufacturers, Oswald Mosley, those folks wanted, wanted fascism. Fascism means a highly centralized authoritarian society in which religion is everywhere, in which patriotism is everywhere, in which any leftist is dragged away in the middle of the night and exterminated, and, and that's how you're going to defeat the communists. And that faction seized control in Germany and in Italy, and it tried to seize control in Britain and failed, and it tried to seize control in France and failed, and ultimately France was invaded. And that was one view. That was the view of factory owners. That was the view of lower levels of capital about how to defeat communism. However, the Rockefeller family and the Fabian Society of Britain had a very different view about how to defeat communism. Their view was the complete opposite. They said, if we're going to defeat the communists, we have to steal their thunder. Right? Communists say that in order to, you know, you know, in order to liberate women, we need communist revolution. Well, instead, we're going to form a feminist movement that is that is not communist, and so people don't have to become communists if they want to be feminists. And uh, you know, communists say that uh, that that you need a revolution in order to uh, in order to liberate the working class. Well, we're going to create a trade union movement that's carefully controlled by us and not communist, and then people won't join the trade union movement. And we are going to try and. And instead of locking society down to defeat the communists, we are going to completely open up society to defeat the communists. We're going to start talking about gay rights. We're going to start talking about, uh, you know, uh, legalizing abortion. We're going to, we're going to, we are going to go all out with our social liberalism to defeat the communists, right? And this was the strategy of big oil. This was the strategy of wealthy finance capitalists. This was the strategy of those folks who are globally oriented, not economic nationalists, but globally oriented, right? We are going to essentially tear down borders. We're going to create global institutions at the Bretton Woods, like the IMF and the World Bank. And we are going to defeat the communists by creating a new liberal order in which we tear apart all the things that, that drive people together to resist, in which we push radical individualism, and that is how we are going to defeat the communists, because no one will want to be a communist, number one, because all the, all the stuff that communists rally around, you know. And number two, we will create so much instability in society that no socialist government will be able to stay in power. And over the course of the Cold War, more and more and more, this viewpoint won out. Zbigniew Brzezinski, Henry Kissinger, right? Marilyn Ferguson and the Aquarian Conspiracy. The idea was to create so much instability in society that, number one, communist and socialist movements, you know, wouldn't have anything to rally around number one, or, or they would be so, things would be so disorganized, people would be so atomized as individuals, they wouldn't have any, any ability to organize and resist. And number two, within the socialist countries, to unleash unrest and chaos and resistance that would, that would destabilize those societies. In order to create one global economy, you must push radical individualism. And that this faction ultimately won out, and that you know, you talk about the Congress for Cultural Freedom program, where the you know the CIA was funding left-wing activism to destabilize. That was anti-communist. You can talk about the Tavistock Institute, in which they did all kinds of research to figure out what kind of rock and roll music people would love to listen to, and and you know you talk about the the CIA's program with drugs. You know, MK Ultra, where LSD was being distributed on college campuses. And there was a huge effort to destabilize Western societies and destabilize the world in the hopes of laying the basis for one global economy and destabilizing and tearing down socialism. And they were very, very effective. They did it, right? It was Beatles music. It was, it was, you know, it was, it was, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll and belief that Western 
Consumerism and Coca-Cola were amazing. That's what brought down the USSR. No, it wasn't Reagan's military spending. That's a myth. No, it was very much a, a political defeat in which Western destabilization, individualism, selfishness, you know, you know, this cultural confusion seeped into the to the socialist countries and created unrest, right? And and this was very boldly blatantly stated at times. Read Zbigniew Brzezinski, read read what these people said. It was an effort to destabilize. And these Americans who were living in small towns, like I grew up in a very small town in Ohio. The place I'm from is where Smucker's Jelly came from. It's called Orville, Ohio, not the west side of Cleveland, very far from Cleveland, about a two-hour drive from Cleveland. And in these small towns and in these little communities where people had lived a very traditional life, right? Things were normal. Life was predictable. All of a sudden, you had Beatles music. All of a sudden, you had rock and roll. All of a sudden, you had these things, and these people were terrified, right? The power of the Western world was unleashing instability. These folks didn't have the language to understand what was going on. They just knew that something evil was coming out of the governments, something evil was coming out of the big media, and they didn't understand it. And it's, you can compare it to when they brought, you know, tractors, when the Soviet government brought tractors to little villages in Ukraine, and the local priest would say, that is a devil machine, and the, the local peasants would start stoning the tractors to get the devil machine out of there. Well, the, the priest, his real agenda is he knows the communists are not religious, he's going to be out of a job pretty soon, especially if that tractor works and people start eating more, then they're going to listen to the communists and not him, but he's saying, that's a devil machine. Right? Well, these people in rural parts of the United States and small towns are, are terrified of the instability that is coming out uh, of the Western world. How it seems like drugs and chaos and rock and roll and, and all this instability, all of their beliefs are being torn asunder, right? That this, this cultural liberalism is coming at them. They don't know what it is. And so they're trying to give a name to it. And that's what you can call the satanic panic, right? That's what that was. That's why Harry Potter and all of that was, yeah, I mean, that's essentially what was going on there. And I remember this very vividly. This was a big part of my life. And I used to have arguments with people um, about it. I remember, like, for example, uh, one thing people would say to me, like, it was this fact they discovered, did you know there's actually a church of Satan? And so being the child that I was, this is before the internet, mind you, I went to the library, and I got out the encyclopedia, and I opened up Church of Satan, and I read about it. And I read that the Church of Satan was a philosophical association that believes in selfishness and Ayn Rand, and they don't actually worship a deity named Satan. And I would say, well, actually, according to the encyclopedia, yes, there is a Church of Satan, but they don't worship a deity named Satan. They are a group of, you know, people who believe in free market capitalism and libertarian ideas and selfishness. And people would look at me, you looked up Satan in the encyclopedia? You know, so there you go. I mean, it was like, you, you actually looked for facts about what we're arguing about? You know, I mean, that was the response to me, right? Um, you know, I mean, it was just kind of like these people didn't want to think. They didn't want to think. They were kind of scared of thinking. Um, but, you know, I, I remember the, the satanic panic and how big it was, and it was a big thing, and people underestimated it. It didn't happen in New York City, or it probably did, but, like, it wasn't, like, a big thing. I, you know, New York City public school kids weren't being mobilized. I'm sure they had Harry Potter and all the New York public schools. There are evangelicals. Fundamentalism exists in New York City, but it's not, it doesn't have power. It's not running the government. It's not running the school boards. It doesn't have the ability to shut down other people. And, uh... You know, um, you know, I remember the satanic panic and how, how weird it was. And I felt like no matter what it was that came out, they would find a way that it would be satanic. And, and it was, like, ridiculous. They would go to, like, great leaps and ends to figure out that it was satanic. Um, you know, I mean, it was just, it was childish. But it was part of that settler culture. And that's a big part of the American right that makes the American right a little bit different from the right in Europe. Um, it's, it's very much a settler right wing, right? It's like, if you watch, there's a, there's previews for this, this movie, uh, that, that Kevin Sorbo, the guy who was Hercules, um, he, he just did a movie, uh, where Antifa are the villains. And if you watch it, 
you know, I mean, you watch this preview. Kevin Sorbo, big muscly guy, and he has his family, and they have their nice little cabin in the woods where they're a lovely family, and they're these scary Antifa people who he has to go fight and protect his little family in the woods. And that's very much, um, that's very, very much the the aspect of um, of what it was. It was very much a, a, a what you might call a um, a settler kind of thing. It's like well, we're on our own, right? That that we're you know. And if you look at it, the homeschooling movement, for example, I, there were kids down the block from me who were homeschooled. The homeschooling movement, um, and you know, the right to bear arms, and a lot of these things that are very much an obsession of the American right. It's based on this, I'm going to have my family separate from everyone else in the middle of the woods all by myself and no one will touch me. And it's this fear that the government is going to come get them, right? That, that the government is going to come get them and they're locked and loaded and, you know, it's like the disaster movie, the survivalism, right? During the Cold War, people were like building bunkers in their basements because they thought that the Soviet Union was going to, you know, bomb them and it was going to be the end times and, 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 you know, it was it was this kind of like the world is against me, but I'm gonna get in a house with my wife and kids and lock it down. I've got my gun, so no one can come and rob me, and no one can come and take me away. And I've got my gun, and I've got my and it, it's very much a settler, and that's why it's a rural kind of phenomenon. Is it's very much this kind of settler fantasy of 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 being separate from everyone else, being super religious, you know. You almost feel like a lot of the the you know white European immigrants who came from Europe were like people who didn't like other people, and they felt uh, you know they, they 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 wanted to go and be religious in the middle of the woods and not be bothered by anyone else. They wanted to go camp out, right? It's it's weird you know to think that way, but it's like they they saw the USA as this vast unsettled territory. Well, Native America there, but they, you know, I mean, racist white settlers didn't care much for Native Americans. And it was kind of like, we see the USA as this big giant woods where we can camp out every day and cook our own food and be super religious and no one will bother us and and we'll have this cabin in the middle of the woods and have guns. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a very, very strange phenomenon and it's mixed in with religion and it's mixed in with, uh, with, with kind of anti-social uh, values and it's kind of this feeling that the government and the state is out to get you and you know, you talk about the settler culture, that's that's a whole other thing we can talk about. But regardless, the American right, and I'm talking like the American far right, like the John Birch Society and stuff like that, it is very, very, um, yeah, it was very interesting. I saw someone sent me a super chat about Mao's revolution or something like that, and um, maybe someone can repeat that. I always want to answer super chats when I get them, but it like went by really fast. It was like $2.00. Mao's famine revolution something I I what did they say does someone want to repeat it to me I I it went by too fast um but yeah I I just wanted to I wanted to talk about that um shout out to the farmers during Mao's revolution yeah well there you go yeah very good shout out I mean and and you know hail the communes right I mean you know the um the farmers and, you know, I mean, the, the the peasantry was who made the revolution, but they weren't settlers. I mean, these are people who, it was very collective. I mean, the villages in China, it was a very, very collectivist kind of thing. And, and someone raised that during the class, actually. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the peasantry, right? I mean, the, we never really had a peasantry in the United States, right? That wasn't exactly the way things were here in the USA. The small farmer in the USA was never really a peasant, right? It wasn't like, you know, they may have had to, you know, lose their farms to big banks or something, but there weren't like a local gentry. You know, we never really had a peasant class in the USA, so to speak. I mean, we had tenant farmers in the South and that was close. That was definitely close. The tenant farm system was particularly awful. Sharecroppers, um, you know, that was particularly an awful way of doing things, but it was never full on feudalism per se. It was it was like feudalism. Uh, slavery became kind of feudalism for a couple generations, I guess. Uh, very interesting. 